The following message is from Lifeline Heart of Worship. We hope this is a blessing to your life. Youth, summer's around the corner. How do you like that? You like that, huh? The parents are like, no, send them back to school. Send them back to school. <laughs> All right. So how many of you enjoyed part four last week, isolation? That was good, yes? I do want to let you know that those CDs are available. If you don't listen to them on podcasts or you just want a CD copy, they are available. The whole set is available there at the bookstore, along with the Hope Alive DVDs for 25 uh, if you want to bless somebody with those powerful testimonies, somebody that's hope is just down. Those are powerful, powerful uh, uh, sermon series that we've done here recently. Um, Isaiah 55, 11. We're hitting the final part of building the vision and the whole structure of Nehemiah. This is it. This is the final piece. We've talked about broken walls. We talked about preparation. We talked about confrontation last week. We talked about isolation, intimidation, and in insinuation. Today we're going to talk about the final piece, determination. And so Isaiah 55, 11, like I said, if you have your Bible, your Bible app or the Lifeline app, please read along. If not, it will be on your screen. So is my word, it says, that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Somebody help me preach here. But will accomplish what I desire and the for which I have sent it. Let me read that again. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the for which I have sent it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your youth. We thank you for ladies and men that are here today, Father God. We thank you for every individual walking through these doors, Lord. We just ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to do your thing, to continue to manifest your power in the lives that are here today. Some are lost, some are broken, some are confused, some are hurt. And Father God, this is the hospital, not because it's lifeline, but because it's your house. We thank you, Lord, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to start mending the broken heart, Father God. But we ask you to break the hardest heart as well, Lord. Holy Spirit, speak through me and let me just say what needs to be said and remove anything that needs to be removed from my mind. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Would somebody say, turn to your neighbor and say, determination. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to ask you not to get distracted as I go fly through this the way we normally do it. Isaiah 55, 11, you see it up again. This is such a powerful word, church, because we need to remember. I know we know, but sometimes we need to just be reminded that you don't serve a human God. You serve a God who is omnipotent. You serve a God who is that omniscient. He's all power, all powerful at all times, at all places. And so understand that God is not like us, that when we say something, sometimes what we say, are, you know, things come up, we break promises, we... We don't follow through tragedy, mistakes, whatever happens. But understand one thing, that you serve a God that when his word comes out of his mouth, it will not be returned empty. It, it, it's going to come to fruition. It's going to come to life. It's going to come to pass. And so uh, realize that, that if God said it, you can count on it. If God said it, you can count on it. And I think a lot of times, church, we put more basis and more a weight on the word that we get from people that are not even faithful and we put it into our spirits and then we feel shot down we feel like oh man you know I, I was gonna graduate I, I'm talking to graduates now man I, I was gonna go to college but they keep telling me that I'm not gonna do it yes but what does God say in your life because if God spoke it and you say well pastor it's because I, I I don't have the funds to do it don't worry you serve a God that owns the gold and the silver and he can make a way where there's no way and so it's a matter, it's a matter, church, it's a matter of wondering who are you listening to? Because so many, the, the purposes and the plans on your life have already been set. But a lot of times because we get negativity, we get stuff from other people, we, we abort those promises. We abort those blessings because we, we get shot down by the negativity. You know what? Sometimes you need to cut it out and just count on this scripture. This is one of the most powerful verses, one of my favorites. It will not we will not return to me empty because I love what it says, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve 
the purpose for which I sent it. God doesn't just speak to speak. He says it so that there can be plan and purpose in your life. He says it because if I'm, if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna speak it, it's just gonna come to pass. I don't, have, I don't have to just be speaking words or blabbing words. I'm telling you what I believe in your life. So it's just a matter of you taking it, believing it, and running with it, amen? So as we continue in Nehemiah, we're going to chapter six. You've seen the story. He's gone through so much opposition. He's gone through, even his own people are turning on him. It's gotten really bad. And now, and now the wall is finally completed. They've been, they've been dealing with broken walls. They, they've been exposed to the enemy. And, and a lot of us, our homes right now, we're being exposed to the enemy. And so that's exactly where I want to finish today's sermon series. So if you've not caught the other four, four parts, please listen to them. They will bless you. So watch what it says in verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Verse 16. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. I, I want you to understand one thing when we read these two verses, like that scripture says that when he says something, it's going to come to pass. Understand, church, that we always win. I'm going to say that again. We always win. You're, you're going to lose a little bit of some battles and you might think that the battle is, no, you're going to win the war though. You're going to get a little scraped up. You're going to get hurt a little bit. You're going to, your feelings are going to be uh, shaken somewhat. Your faith might even be tested. But you understand one thing, that if you stay in, 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 in the right track with God, you're going to win. You're going to win. And the scripture here says that the wall is finally completed. 52 days later. And then I love what it says. When my enemy saw the tweet, when my enemy saw the Facebook and they saw the little selfie that Nehemiah took behind the wall, because he did that. I don't know if you knew that, but he really did that. Okay, they heard about this. It says the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence. There's something to be said that when you are determined to do what God has called you to do, it shakes the foundation of your enemies. Please understand this. Please understand this. And, and so they're completing something. They have a sense of satisfaction, but their enemies have a sense of, of self-confidence. It's gone down. They're now afraid. Determination, church, pays off. They've endured threats, opposition, the mounds of rubble and dreadful work that they had to do. They endured a famine. They endured slavery. If you heard the sermon series, they endured internal strife. They endured struggle. But because God spoke a word and Nehemiah listened, the wall is completed. God spoke. Nehemiah listened. And it came to pass. And what's amazing is the speed, the speed of the project. This wall, church, this wall should have taken years to build. It should have taken a long time to build. It took 52 days. You know that, that we've kind of guessed around about how long our church is going to get built in two, four, five. I can't tell you the exact time that it's going to get built, but I'm going to tell you one thing. It's going to get built quicker than we think. I believe that. I believe that. And, and, and only for one reason. Because if you go back to verse 16, if you go back to verse 16 and look at the last part of it, because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. That's it. That's the reason why this wall is so important. They saw God's hand in it. Nobody else could have done it. Understand that they're building a wall there's no Home Depot. There is no Lowe's. They don't have these awesome, and you don't have jackhammers and, you know, oh, we got the belt and we got the staple gun. It doesn't work that way. They did this by hand. They did this by hand. So you can see the tiredness, the frustration, the bitterness. You can see all that stuff kind of building up, but it's finally paying off. Just nine months earlier, he's in court. Four months, he's in prayer and fasting. The task is so huge that even the Jews around that live in that area, they look at the wall and they say, well, it's never going to get rebuilt. It just happened. I, I, want you to, I want you to just really just take what I'm saying right now. They, they, the other Jews are walking around. These are Jews with power and authority. They're walking around and they see this wall and they're like, God, what a shame. What a shame that the wall came down. This was our livelihood. This was our refuge. This was our protection for our family, for our family's family and their kids. And, and we just look at it and we say, God, what a shame. What a shame. It, it couldn't get done. They don't say, they don't say, look at it. They don't say, 
you know what this has to change we need to unite and make this wall again that's why I had to take a layman named Nehemiah to do it. Everybody else was too scared to do it because they knew it takes work. Let me tell you something right now, church. A lot of your walls in your house are down. They are broken and it takes a lot of work. And that's probably the reason why they remain down because you keep looking at it and you keep saying, well, my son's never going to change and my husband's never going to change and this situation's never going to change. And you're exactly right because you keep going against the same word that God has spoke and his word does not come back empty. But because you keep speaking negativity, even in your own life, you can't expect to build a wall. And so, so Nehemiah sees it He's all prayed up. He's all fired up. They get the job done. It hasn't been easy. And when you stick with it, church, the enemy loses confidence. And it's interesting because let me just backtrack to you a little bit of the comments. Chapter 2, verse 10. They were upset that Nehemiah came to help the Israelites. It starts right there. There's already some, some, some strife right there because they can't stand that some guy's going to come to help the Israelites. Chapter 2 and verse 19. They mocked and ridiculed the Jews and accused them of rebellion. Chapter 4 and verse 3. They ridiculed as a wall was going up. They made jokes and comments like, really? Even a fox can get over that wall. And they continue to just make fun and make fun and make fun. Chapter 4 and verse 11, they saw that the wall is getting built. So now, forget that. Now they're trying to threaten them by killing them. And then chapter 6, if you continue, it's still continued full of threats, deceit, rumors. That was last week when we tell you that God is trying to, or not God, but the enemy is trying to isolate Nehemiah to try to destroy him. Because the closer you are to giving birth to a baby, the more pain you feel. And that's when a lot of us quit. We don't have the determination, church. So let me keep going. So now the walls are up. The, all, the walls are up. Nehemiah is probably saying, wow, this has been great work. He probably thinks, all right, I'm going to take a Sabbath. No. No. And this is where I want to, this is really where the foundation of today's sermon. Because he's already shut up his enemies. He's not talking. He's just simply acting. The Lord's hand is on his life. He'd be easy to say, Nehemiah, you're done. Great job. Good and faithful servant. Move on, right? No. Here's the truth, church. The God that you serve and the enemy that we resist is an enemy that doesn't give up. It is an enemy that constantly changes his tactics, changes his strategies, to get to what he needs to do to continue to destroy the plan and purpose in your life. So what does he do? They tried applying pressure from the outside. It didn't happen. So he says, all right, then I'm going to infiltrate. I'm going to infiltrate Nehemiah. You better get this church because this is going to be deep right here. And if you remember, Tobiah had already infiltrated the community. He, if you didn't catch it, let me just read it to you so you can see it. In verse 17 of chapter 6. Watch what it says. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. Verse 18, for many in Judah were under what? Remember that phrase. They were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehohanan, it says, had married the daughter of Meshulam. God, these names are terrible. Son of Barakiah. But watch what it says in verse 19. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and telling him what I said. And Tobias sent letters to intimidate me. I don't know if you're catching what is going on here, but watch what's going on right here. Remember the three stooges that were giving him a hard time? Sanballat, Tobias, another one. Well, it just so happens that Tobiah marries into this family. <laughs> he marries into this family and it clearly tells me in those days many letters were sent to and from Tobiah. Now, you got to understand there's no social media then. So you got to ask yourself, how come every time Nehemiah was trying to make progress how come the enemy knew what they were doing? 
How come the enemies were aware of every step that Nehemiah was taking? Because <laughs> there was somebody in the family. There was somebody infiltrated already on the inside and his name was Tobiah. This is the same Tobiah that wanted to kill Nehemiah. This is the same Tobiah that wanted to bring him to a neutral site to say, hey, let's discuss this. It wasn't about discussion. He wanted to kill him. This is the same Tobiah that had accused him, had rumors, had called him this, had called him that. This is the same guy. But now the family is defending him by saying, no, no, they kept reporting to me, verse 19. They kept reporting to me his good deeds and telling me what I had said. And Tobiah, behind closed doors, underneath the blanket, sent me letters to intimidate me. <laughs> the guys, it's a son-in-law to a family that is now inside the wall. And they're saying, Nehemiah, you, you know, you're talking bad about this guy, but this guy's family. Nehemiah goes, are you all serious? Are you all serious? This is the same guy that was trying to kill me. No, no, you don't understand. He's a good guy. He means well. <laughs> but if you didn't catch that verse, in verse 18, for many in Judah were under oath. You have to go back and understand what that meant. What happened was, do you remember the famine? Do you remember all the strife that they were going through? Well, they needed money. Guess who do you, who do you think they borrowed it from? Tobiah. So now Tobiah had given them some money in return for some information. Church, let me tell you right now, don't worry about your enemies. Worry about your so-called friends. <laughs> They're the ones that are right next to you. They're the ones that are, eat from your table. They're the ones that you call. So, so, so Pastor G is saying, I shouldn't have no friends. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, be very careful. If you are not or you do not have the spirit of discernment, be very, very careful. Nehemiah's like, are you serious? We just built this wall. And now you're going to tell me that we found out who the snake was? All along he's been inside? Sending text messages back and forth? What was their motivation? They were under oath to him. And that's why they had so much knowledge and knew every step that Nehemiah was taking. Pastor, what does this have to do with me? All right, so I'm going to tell you something and I'm going to teach you something that is going to rub some people the wrong way. But thank God, I don't really care what you think. So watch what it says in 2 Corinthians 6.14. This is such a powerful verse. This has infiltrated relationships. This has divided churches. This has messed up Christian businesses. If you're ready, here we go. The scripture says, do not be yoked together with who? unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness let me stop right there now again this is for some of you and it's going to rub you the wrong way but i got to tell you because this is what the scripture is showing and i have to teach you if i don't teach it then it's on me it doesn't ask us it's telling us do not be yoked together with unbelievers Please don't misinterpret that as relationship, relational acquaintances. I have a lot of friends that are not believers. I'm not talking about that. There's a lot of people that I can come in contact with and I'm okay with. They respect who I am. I respect who they are. They don't want nothing to do with church. They don't want nothing to do with the spiritual side of my life. They just simply want to be a, a, a connection, an acquaintance, a friend. That's why that word friend is so uh, overrated. I, I, I believe we use it too, too easy, too much. And here it's not talking about friendship. It's talking about being yoked together. A connection, a relationship, a, 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 a trust, a love, a, 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 a bond so great. This is what it's saying. Don't you dare get connected like this form with unbelievers. So let me just start off with dating. If you're still, woman, let me talk to the women here. If you're still that one that you're saying, I'm praying, I'm praying, and I'm praying for God to send me somebody, and you keep looking in the trash for them, and you think 
that because you have great breasts and a great butt, and I'm sorry, and I know we're in Power Sunday here, but you think because you got it all figured out, oh, he'll change. He's not going to change, honey. I've seen it year in, year out. I've seen it over and over where men will go to church next to the one they want because they want something else. They don't want the relationship with Christ. They want a relationship in bed. Can I preach? And so we get connected with unyoked or people that are not believers. And then we get into relationships and we wonder, why didn't they work? They go to church. They were there with me at church. They went to church three weeks in a row. Church. Church. The devil goes to church. Be careful who you consider yourself, your next, uh, uh, your relationship, your partner, your spouse. And if you're already married, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> now you just got to pray and fast and ask the Lord for complete change. But if you're in the dating scene, women, men, men, I'm telling you, men, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. It, it, it amazes to me how people are looking for, for uh, like that time, I'm looking for love in all the wrong places. That's why I wore my boots today. I was going to sing country. <laughs> we keep looking in the wrong place. And then we wonder why we get stuck with garbage. Excuse me. Don't connect yourself with unbelievers. They will say and do anything they want to say so that they can please you. But they're not really there to please you. Can I go deeper? <laughs> You're asking for it. I'm going to go deeper. Now I'm going to talk a little bit different about connecting to churches. Oh, here it goes. Pastor, well, I, I, I've been attending six churches. <laughs> but, but, but right, Pastor, I mean, it's not, there's nothing wrong with visiting churches. There's nothing wrong with being connected and being all. They use that phrase connected because they tried it. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with being connected with many, many, many churches. And I said, oh, really, what, what, what are you doing? And I said, no, nothing. I just sit. And, and what are you doing? No, no, nothing. And what are you doing? This? No, nothing either. Ooh, there's no, there's really no connection. What I'm trying to tell you is until you connect and root yourself in a church, not many churches. God never called us to be connected to many churches. He said, get connected under one church, under one vision, so that you can give fruit. The problem is we have a lot of people jumping around like they're church hoes and they keep going from church to church and church and wondering why they're only giving weeds and wondering why they never give fruit where you've never been planted long enough anywhere to give anything. It's the same thing trying to yoke yourself with different... Get connected where you belong. Even if it isn't Lifeline, even if it isn't here, find a church, love your pastor, get connected, submit to the vision and see the fruit that it will bring to your family. But the moment you keep jumping in and out of church, like it's some kind of fast food. Well, I don't really like what the pastor said this week, so now I'm going to go visit this church next week. Oh, I love what the pastor said today. Yeah, because he was rubbing your ear and he was making you feel good. I'm not here to make you feel good. God didn't call me to do a, do a daycare center. He says, call and make disciples of them. And making disciples means rubbing you the wrong way. Sometimes we got to get out of our comfort zone. And if you really want to have plan and purpose in your life and want to see the fruit in your life, get connected somewhere. Come on, touch somebody and say determination. Determination, determination. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. Don't be yoked. Don't be yoked with them. Pastor, but you said that on the Sabbath we can go visit other churches. You're right. I gave you permission. You have permission. But I'm telling you, where are your roots? Where are you connected? Where are you being fed? Well, Pastor, it's because I like the way this one preaches, and I like the music over here, and I like the children's ministry over here. If they could all have it. This is not Burger King. You don't get it your way. No church is going to be perfect. And the moment you find that perfect church and you get there, you're going to ruin it. So don't find it. There's no such thing. I'm not mad. I'm just trying to help you out of your church. Pastor, I don't see any fruit. Talk to my pastors. Well, how many pastors do you have? <laughs> Church, we've got to be careful who we connect ourselves with. Can I go deeper? You're starting a business. Be careful not to connect with unbelievers. 
Because the moment it hits the fan, their faith will be in the bank and your faith will be in the creator. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful who you yoke yourself with. Look what I put here in my notes and I got to keep going for the sake of time. When you are connected to or committed to someone who does not love God, your loyalty to God is compromised. I'm say it again. I'm going to say it again. When you are connected to or committed to someone who does not love God, your loyalty to God is also compromised. It doesn't mean you hate them. I'm not saying that. We're not talking about acquaintances and friends. No, we're talking about connections. Who do you consider yourself? What are you connected to? And I'm telling you, and, and, and Pastor, but, but even the same thing in relationship. Look, me and my wife, going on 18 years of marriage, we have problems. We have problems. I mean, tough problems. We have problems. And guess what? You know what keeps us together? The yoke that we both believe. So what happens in marriage that has one in and one out? Now who do you go with? Because one believes and one does not. I'm telling you, church, I'm trying to save you some strife here. Stop looking for people in the wrong places. Come to church, humble yourself, and start praying. And God will send you someone. He really will. Trust me. He sent me to her. Okay, I'll just stop right there. <laughs> I love you, baby. Okay. So then what do we got to do? The wall is complete. I got to keep going. The wall is complete. We're celebrating. Let's throw up help rally, no? Now wisdom and vigilance kicks in. Look at what Nehemiah 1 and 3 says. Verse 1. After the wall. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place the gatekeepers the musicians and the Levites were what appointed watch what it says verse 2 I, please, please let me read verse 1 again so you can really understand where I'm going with this because some of you are, are gonna be in a building uh, uh, process right now you want to make your house strong again you want to establish foundation watch what it says and then don't miss next month June next Sunday it starts a new series called authority you want to know why there's violence out there authority at home it's going to be a powerful series next week next week it's start really you don't want to miss that series but watch verse one after the wall had been rebuilt watch what he says i had set the doors in place the gatekeepers the musicians and the levites were appointed notice he said it he said it why he's the one in line with christ he's the one in line with the vision he didn't just build the wall and just say all right anybody can do whatever they want now no, no. He puts everybody in place. Verse 2, I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hananiah along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of what? Not popularity. <laughs> Integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them also appoint residents of Jerusalem. Now watch this. The workers become watchmen. Let me tell you, church, I, I've seen this all the time too. People work so hard to restore a relationship, a business, a financial problem, and it only takes one mistake to ruin it. And you know why that happens? Because we are not vigilant. We do not place people at guard. We do not hold ourselves accountable with anybody else. We set ourselves up for failure. So we relax. We kick, oh, finally my marriage is on the right track. My finances are on the right track. My, my kids are doing, uh, doing where they need to be. They're coming to It's going good. And we put our guard down. That's when you got to be at your highest guard. Vigilant. Vigilant. And here, he's put people right in specific places. And not only that, he doesn't just put them anywhere. He literally puts, when you really study where, where he put them, he puts the people to guard their own homes because he knows they'll fight harder to protect their own families. Why? Why will they protect? Why will they fight? Here it is. Because they were the ones that sweat. They were the ones that worked hard to build up the wall. When you build something from your own sweat, from your own work, you'll appreciate to defend it. Can I preach? The reason why our children do not appreciate anything today is because they don't know how to work for anything today. I know the youth are looking at me like, oh, Pastor, you don't be saying that. It's the truth. It's the truth. 
but you look at those youth and I can mention a couple of them right now a couple of them that don't even have a parent by their side that have a broken home but they've continued to fight they continue to strive and they're surviving and they're succeeding and they're pressing forward I'm telling you right now we got our honor right now Sabrina Sabrina I'm honoring you today because you know your life you know your history and you're the first to make it to where no other of your family has made it and God says I have seen your tears I have seen your work but God says rise up because I'm about to bless you far more than you can ever ask think or imagine give the Lord a praise offering may be seated I'm telling you I'm telling you it's the moment when you teach our youth to take care of things to work for something they'll think twice they'll think twice and we've lost that you know why because we use the added phase well that's because pastor I had nothing growing up so now I want to give them everything be careful there's nothing wrong with giving what your kids do what you're giving them this there's nothing wrong with it but make sure there's something tied to it so they can appreciate it nowadays we give our kids not even a thank you and we're raising an ungrateful generation but here I'm, I'm gonna say tell you the phrases look what Nehemiah did be careful who you put a, as your watchman in your house and in your family be careful who you say you trust be careful who you leave your kids with oh oh but 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 he's this and he was a leader or he's that or he's be careful be careful be careful your spirit needs to be connected in tune with the Holy Spirit I'm telling you I'm telling you I've seen leaders and I've seen, I'm telling you, I've seen so much molestation. I've seen so much abuse. I've seen it, church. And it's in front of our eyes, but we don't see it because we look at the popularity rather than the integrity. Okay, I got to keep going. And so he puts these two men, Hananiah and Hananiah. What was their qualification? Simple. They were men of integrity and they feared the Lord. Find some people who fear the Lord. Find some people who fear the, who really say, man, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to do this. I, I fear the Lord. Those are the people that you want around you. Now notice, notice what he said. He says, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. And, and then while the gatekeepers are still on duty. So, so I want to just give you some, some, some analogies here and some illustrations here. Because the gates need to be open. You, you cannot church, you cannot build your house, your, your family, your relationship. I'm now I'm talking about relationships that have, has, have had issues of non-trust. You cannot build a relationship and then close the gates permanently. Because what happens is that then you become a prisoner in your own home. You become a prisoner in your own gates. And that happens when, when people have failed us, when people have hurt us, when people have done this, just then we're very careful to allow people again in our lives. That's not always good either. So Nehemiah is saying, I want you open the gates, but there's a time limit. And not only is there a time limit, he says, I'm going to have a watchman right there. Meaning just because my gates are open doesn't mean you're welcome to come in. I can leave my house unlocked but it doesn't mean you're allowed in I say who comes into my house not everybody comes into my hi pastor but do muy 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 no 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 it's not about muy 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 is that it took us a long time to build the wall that God has given us you think I'm gonna let a snake just come right in and try to destroy it are you serious well then I'm going to another church I'll give you a ride I'm telling you, I'm telling you, people get, uh, people get, so, I say this all the time, people want more of a relationship with their pastor than they do with Jesus. Get over it. I may die tomorrow, but Jesus is here forever. Watch. So you cannot leave it closed because you become a prisoner. And then he goes on to say, and then they will be closed to keep the enemies out. So there's a time and place for everything we have to have that discerning spirit again I can't say that enough because a city that never opens or never cl closes its gates and leaves it wide open what you're inviting disaster you're inviting disaster and that's what happens a lot in our families and our relationships we're inviting disaster you know that a certain couple should not be there 
you know that a certain girl, a certain man, a certain friend of your youth, uh, but, but if I tell him something, uh, that's his friend. And if I, if I say no, I mean, well, they're going to be in the house. I'm going to talk about authority next week. I'm going to talk about authority next week. I'm telling you, parents, we need to step up. I don't mean any disrespect when I say this, but the floods that you've been seeing, they're coming to our house. I'm not talking about water. I'm talking about the enemy. He's raging into our house already. And we're trying to stop it with little bean bags. I'm telling you, church. I'm telling you, church. But what I'm telling you today, two, three things, watch. He's very careful to open them. He's very careful to close them. And there's a time frame and there are watchmen at all times. Wisdom, discernment, revelation. You've heard me say this and this is what I counsel all the time. And the people that I know, they know this. Pastor, what do we pray? Pastor, give me more money. Lord, no, it's not about more money. Pastor, oh, give me another. It's not about another job. Lord, send me a boyfriend. It's not about a boyfriend. You can't handle the one you have. It's about the three things. I'm telling you, if you pray these three things, this is what I learned in my life through my father, and I'm passing it on to you. This is priceless information, church. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom, discernment, and revelation. Pastor, what does that mean? Wisdom will show you how to. Discernment will show you who you should do it with. And revelation, it'll tell you why you had to do it that way. And it answers the three questions. This is why I'm here. This is who, this is why he's here with me. And this is why it had to happen. I'm going to give you some perfect revelation. And I'm finishing up. Uh, as you all know, I was working at the, at the high school. And, and, and uh, I had asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm really just overwhelmed with with 40 hours 50 40 50 hours of work at the school and then having to come in and out of pro rehab and and then counseling on the weekends and then I took on the youth which I love doing the youth youth and we're going to hit it back in August I just said Lord man I'm just really overwhelmed right now Lord and now this building division project came upon us and I thank God for Mike and the team that just been supportive and helping and taking up all the slack and I said Lord what are you doing Lord I I, I don't want to complain because I know you have me here for a purpose. I said, Lord, what, why? Why do you put me through these? I, I feel like I'm stretching thin. I feel like I'm getting sick. I feel like I'm stressed out. I mean, just a pastor the other day, another pastor just committed suicide. Another one. And I said, Lord, why? I, I, and, and, and things were not very good at home because of the stress level. And just, I, just, just very agitated and tired and frustrated and just burnout you know and I said Lord why Lord why and the Lord said you said he spoke to me he said you said and I've spoken to you my world will not come back empty I told you that this church will be great I said yes I understand that Lord your church he says this church pastor he says this church son is going to be great it's going to be grand and therefore I have to stretch you I said what Lord I said, he says I have to stretch you so that when that building comes and it's ready and it's done, you're not going to be having one service. You're going to be having two or three multiple services packed with thousands of people. So I need to stretch you now to prepare you for then. And it started to make sense. I said, I get it now. And as he took me through Moses and as he took me through Joshua and as he took me through Jesus and he took leaders and the thing, he always stretched them and put them to the point of breaking to see because everybody wants a big blessing, but people can't hold the weight. And I said, Lord, you've called this ministry. I'm not standing in this auditorium 25 years later healed from cancer. You didn't save me from that just to be some other hilly billy church or something like that. You changed so that we could be a lifeline to Harlingen, to Laferia, to San Benito, to Raymondville, to Lyford. This church will be great. It will be grand. I believe it. I believe it from the bottom of my heart and I'm encouraging you to step into the vision, step up to what you got to do and say, Pastor, we are with you. We are with you spiritually, we are with you financially, we are with you socially. As we grow, we need you to grow and your families will be blessed and your kids' kids will be blessed. So I'm calling you today, build your wall, put the gatekeepers in place and have a spirit of vigilance in your life so that what God is raising up, no man can come and tear apart. Give the Lord a praise offering I said give the Lord a praise offering 
stay standing, stay standing. Believe, believe with me. Believe with me because I've seen it. I've seen the visions. I've seen the visions and I'm telling you, this is going to be grand. This is going to be grand. And there will be people who will want to destroy this vision. And they will infiltrate themselves into this leadership. But I'm praying for the Lord for wisdom and discernment and revelation. So that we cast any spirit, any demon, any evil activity in this church and we rebuke it. Because I'm not worried about the seats that, that are, I'm, I'm not worried about the seats that we're trying to keep. I'm worried about the seats that are empty because there's so many people that are still hurting out there. That need a place of refuge. September 11th changed everything in America. I don't have to tell you that. We had so many freedoms, but because the enemy infiltrated its way into this country, now you know how hard it is to just take a flight. What am I saying? Freedom is great, but we have to have security. We've got to be vigilant. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to kill your plan. He wants to kill your family. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to ruin the plans that God has for your life. But church, it's time to build the wall. It's time to rebuild the wall. Pastor, but where do I start? It starts with authority. And it begins next week. So today, if there's anybody here that's not saved, you say, Pastor, I don't have Jesus in my heart as my personal Savior. Would you shoot your hand up and actually run down here? We want to celebrate with you. We don't do this hidden and we don't tell people to close their eyes. We do it open eyes because we're celebrating with you. This is nothing to be ashamed of. Is there anybody here? Is everybody here saved? Our altar guards are here ready to pray with you. Everybody here is saved. Everybody here knows Jesus. Amen. We got one coming in. Amen. Oh, we have, oh, no. You're, you're saved, Philip. I'm sorry. You're saved. You're saved. But we do have a gentleman coming up then. And we have a lady coming up. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate with them, church. Let's celebrate with them. Come on up. They want to pray with you. They want to pray with you. Philip, my brother Philip wants to pray with you. Ma'am, right here, we congratulate you. She wants to pray with you. You pray with him, Philip. You pray with him, Philip. Anybody else wants to, is accepting Jesus Christ for the first time. Come on up. Come on up. I think we have another one on this side. Let me see here. Amen. Yes, come on forward. Come up. Come on up. Come on up. Amen. Amen. We have another couple here. Come on up. Come on up. They'll pray with you. They'll pray with you. Brother Philip, you got them. They'll pray with you right here, my friend. You pray with them right there. Awesome. Awesome. We got another one right here. Got another one over here. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Sabrina will pray with her. Sweetheart, the person right behind you is going to pray with you, okay? She'll be praying with you. Robert's going to pray with him. Great. Great. Awesome. Seven people giving their lives to the Lord today. Amen. This is what we're all about, church. This is what we're all about. We're just the messenger. We want people's lives to be changed, all right? As they pray for them, is there anybody else that needs to come on up here and just say, Lord, I just need to come. I just need prayer, Lord. I, I just need to set everything straight in my house. The altar is open. The altar is open for anyone now. Come on up. This is your opportunity. And as you come up, just first things first, if you need to ask for forgiveness, that's what you need to do. Just make your way in, make your way in. Talk to your Lord and Savior. What do I say? You say, just talk to him like you would be talking to me. He just wants to hear you. Just go in there if you can. Just go in there. Make some room. Make some room. If not, you can sit right in the back. There's fine. And we're going to sing this worship song. Let the Holy Spirit fill you. Just bow your heads right there where you're at, church. And let the Holy Spirit do His work. This is not about me touching you or praying for you. This is not about me. This is about the Holy Spirit doing His work. Amen. Amen. Let's 
let's worship him will we will you his arms a fortress for the me so let faith arise let faith arise I dare you to raise your hands right now. I dare you to believe again. I dare you to believe again. Your doubt has been shattered. Your hope has been shattered. God's not finished yet. His word will not be returned empty. I know what I'm telling you. Let the Holy Spirit just pour into your spirit right now. Lord Jesus, we just exalt you right now. You know every need, you know every broken heart. Give direction, Father God. Be still, there is a river that flows from Calvary's tree. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the message. For more information, check out lifelinehow.com.